Good morning and welcome to Necton Submarine STEM 2020. It's wonderful to have you all with us. Amazing to have uh, young people, probably homeschooled for the most part, joining us from the UK, USA, Ukraine, India, Germany, Greece, United Arab Emirates, Australia and Ireland. Great to have you all with us. <laughs> And this is an Encounter EDU Live Lesson with Necton and supported by Inmarsat. Now we've got some shout outs before we get into how you explore the deep with this special Exploring the Deep Live Lesson. And the shout outs are going um, to uh, Maddie Fletcher and Artemon Public School uh, who are dialing in all the way from Sydney, Australia. We have Oscar. Um, who's homeschooling um, in Anglesey. Good morning, Oscar. Uh, we have greetings uh, from the Avgalia Lilidati Private School in Greece and who are excited to be with us and very excited to have you with us too. So good morning to everybody watching from Greece. We have a big hello um, to all the children uh, at Draper's Mills Primary Academy. So good morning to everybody uh, watching probably from home. Um, and a shout out to all the children from Aboyan Lodge who are doing this lesson today. Now, this lesson is Exploring the Deep. We've got Mike um, coming on very shortly. Mike's head of operations from uh, Necton. And will be telling us all about how you put on a big submersible expedition. So on Monday, we heard from Mission Director Oliver Steeds who gave us an overview of why it's important and <clears throat> what we might find if we explore the deep ocean. Yesterday, we had a wonderful talk from Dr. Lucy Woodall, and she was telling us about the seamounts. So that is some of the underwater habitat that the team were exploring. Now, what we want to know now is how do you put all this together? How do you make it work? how many people are involved, and how could you get involved in an expedition like this in the future? Now, without further ado, it's a big welcome to Mike. Good morning, Mike. Good morning, um, everyone. And the wonderful operations, marine operations expert. Mike, I'm gonna hand over to you, and it, it sounds like a huge undertaking, this kind of expedition, and to find out what's involved. Yeah, absolutely. Well, good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us. Yeah, as you've heard from Oliver on Monday and uh, and um, Lucy yesterday, that you've heard about you know what the science is and why we're going to the Indian Ocean, uh, and then it comes down to me to talk to how we do that. Obviously, Necton is a massive expedition. We're a multidisciplinary team. Uh, we had over fifty people on uh, our expedition, and that's from scientists to vessel crew to technicians, to media, to journalists. Um, and that comes down to me to bring out all that together. Uh, so the first thing is a little bit of background about me. Um, I'm an oceanographer, so I studied uh, oceanography at the University of Southampton. And then I moved into hydrographic surveying, which is mapping the ocean floor uh, using a, a variety of different sonar systems. Uh, so that's what I've done for the last five or six years. Um, mainly for wind farm construction and oil and gas projects. And then I've, you know, moved over and joined Necton to help them plan and implement their expeditions. Um, so for Necton, I'm, yeah, my, my title is the head of marine operations. And that has got the responsibility for planning and executing the expeditions. So I work really closely with the science team and Oliver, the mission director, and they decide what we want to do, what, what Nectar wants to do, what the research goals are, what the aims are. And then that's down to me to bring all those people together um, <clears throat> and to find all the equipment and the people and get those on the boat. And then once we're on the boat, the most important thing is that we stay safe. So to make sure that everyone comes back with the same number of fingers and toes that they left with and, and that we have a good time and that we get all of our um, our research goals completed. So that's sort of the overview of the role, and I'll just have a quick, uh, give a quick overview of the what the expedition was for those that weren't there for Oliver or Lucy. 
Um, so Neptune's focus for the series of expeditions is the Indian Ocean. Uh, as you will have heard, the Indian Ocean's got uh, is home to 2.7 billion people, and by 2050, it's estimated that half the world's population will live around uh, the coast of the Indian Ocean. So it's a vital ocean to study. It's one of the least understood oceans. Um, so that's where Necton is focused our expeditions. We did an expedition in 2019 that was just in the Seychelles. And then this year's expedition is in the Seychelles and the Maldives. On the, on the map on your screen, you can see tiny little yellow dots. Uh, the dots on the left are where we were going to be surveying and uh, doing the expedition in the Seychelles. And the ones on the right are the Maldives. Um, this expedition this year was focused on the midnight zone. And the midnight zone is between 1,000 meters and 4,000 meters. Um, and to do that, we need a whole host of different pieces of equipment. Um, so the first piece of equipment we need is our mother vessel, mother ship. And here she is. So this is the, uh, the DSSV pressure drop. Um, it, she's uh, 68 meters long, and she's been purposely uh, refit for submersible and science operations. Uh, it was previously owned by NOAA, and then it was bought by uh, a company called Caledon Oceanic. Caledon owned the, the ship and the submersible, and then she had an extensive refit to make it a, the perfect vessel for scientific research. So you can see on the, on the, on the back there, it's got the A-frame for lifting the submersible. Inside, it's got a uh, a full uh, wet laboratory where we can do our sample analysis and chemical analysis. It's got a mission control and dry lab. That's where we house our submersible team. So on board this boat, there are 14, there were 49 of us. So that's some scientists, some media, some journalists and the vessel crew. Um, and we all lived on board there for, for 35 days at a time. Um, so this ship, the pressure drop, has just finished a massive expedition where it has gone around the world uh, diving to the deepest point of all five oceans. Um, that war, and she finished that at the end of 2019, and then Necton took over, took her over this year for a month to do our expedition. So then the next piece of equipment that we need to bring together is the submersible. This is a submersible made by uh, a US-based company called Triton. And I won't go into too many details because I think tomorrow you have some of the engineers and the pilots from Triton that will be giving you all the details about how the submersible works. But this is the, this is the submersible that we were using. And this is the only uh, submersible in the world that can go to full ocean depths. So that's the bottom of any ocean anywhere on the planet. Um, and we need this submersible because we want to go down and investigate and explore the Indian Ocean to 4,000 meters. And this is the only, uh, one of the only submersibles that can do that. Um, then, then the next thing, so th sorry, those are the two most important things. That's the vessel and that's the submersible. And that's what we need to, to explore. But then in order to run those and to actually make the expedition happen, we need a team of people. And this is the most the most important part of any expedition is the people. Without people, you know, we can have all the best equipment in the world, but without a great team, we don't have anything. And Necton has a fantastic team of people. So as I mentioned, we have over 50, uh, 50 different people from different, different countries, different specialities, different roles and responsibilities on board. Um, so I'm just going to talk through now the different, uh, the different teams on board and how they what they do on board and how they got into being on part, being on the expedition. So the first team we have, which is probably the most important team, um, because that's what I used to do, is um, the, the mapping team. So when we arrive at any location anywhere, before we put the submersible in the water, we need to know where we are, we need to know what the seabed looks like, and we need to know how that if it's if, if safe to dive and find an interesting dive location. So we have a team of uh, hydrographic surveyors and mapping specialists. They will use the, they use sonar and basically we, we survey the area and we can create these fantastic that you can see on the screen now, these fantastic 3D maps and models of the, uh, of the ocean floor. 
And then from these models, we can then, well, the, the science team can then decide where they want to dive. So we're looking for, um, in the 2019 expedition, we were looking at uh, steep slopes and areas off in the uh, coastal waters off of some of the islands in the Seychelles. And then this year, um, in the midnight zone where we've been in our last expedition in a couple of weeks ago, we were looking at seamounts. So, you know, we want to find out where these seamounts are. So once we found that, we want to find which flank, which side of the seamount we want to survey, sorry, which we want to dive with the submersible. So without this this mapping information, um, we, we don't know where to go. And that's, so this is, it's vital for what we're doing. Um, and this is what I used to do for a long time. This is what I, I studied oceanography and mapping at university. Um, and then the next team we have, uh, we then have the, the lander team. So this is another piece of equipment that's operated primarily by the scientists and the submersible team. But this is uh, a pathfinder, if you like. This, this lander we, we send down to the seabed. Once we've chosen a site, we send the landers down first and they sit on the seabed and they send back vital data. They send back temperature, salinity, the pressure. Um, and from that, then the submersible team can, can look at the conditions at the bottom and they can decide how long it's going to take for the sub to get down there. They can look at how many... Um, they can look at how much weight they need and what settings they need to do to make the submersible be able to get down to these different depths. Um, this this also collects vital water sample uh, water chemistry data so it collects uh, bottom water from just above the seabed and then at the end of the day when we've finished with that we send an acoustic signal and that recovers and comes straight up to the surface and then as you can see from this picture this is how we uh, how we recover it back onto the ship um, and then we have another just another picture here of the submersible but this is on the deck so from this picture, you'll be able to see all the different sensors that we have on board. So this submersible is, it's 11 tons, uh, carries two people, and on board to, to achieve our science goals, we've got uh, a suite of cameras, um, sensors. So again, we're measuring the ocean temperature, salinity, pressure, depth. And it's also got, you can just see behind the, uh, the orange straps there, uh, manipulator arm. And that allows the pilots to interact with their surroundings and collect samples or rocks, you know, coral, anything that the scientists want to analyze further on the surface, we can use that arm to, to collect those samples. And then as you can see from this picture, this is how the, the submersible gets in the water. And what I was saying about the, the massive team that we have, because this submersible is so large, and so big and you know lots of very delicate bits on the outside of it lots of temperature um sorry lots of sensors and equipment it, it takes a lot of people to deploy it so majority of our team are just there to get this submersible in the water we have a, a team of five submersible um technicians and pilots we have it take um crane operators hydraulic specialists to operate all the hydraulic equipment as you can see we have a safety boat in the water um, we have a, a dedicated a swimmer, and that's the person on top of the submersible. There, they do, they're responsible for unhooking the uh, unhooking the submersible, unhooking the ropes back on again. So, as you can see, that the, the people are uh, are the key to our operation, and it's it, it's very involved. And then we get on to the media. So we have you know part of Necton's uh, Necton's expeditions are the storytelling. And this is a key part of what, of what Necton do, of what we do. Um, if it wasn't for the media team that we have on board and the journalists that we have, they, then the story of Necton wouldn't get told. The, the, the discoveries that we make, the areas that we go to, no one would know about them. So it's a, the media are a key part of, of documenting the journey and getting the information out there to help inform various global policy and you know the other and get the, get the science out there. So on our last expedition, we had visiting journalists from Sky and AP, along with our dedicated team of Necton, uh, Necton Media. Then 
just moving over one more slide, you can see here that nothing on board the ship happens without the uh, the media department there. Anything, any deployments, any recoveries, anything. There's always a camera there to tell the story, um, which is vital for uh, for Necton. And then the next team that we have on board are water chemists. So the water chemists use this uh, piece of equipment you'll see here, and that's a, a CTD sensor. So that's a conductivity, temperature, and depth. And what you can see on the outside of that there is uh, water bottles um, to collect water samples from different depths. So this piece of equipment is really important um, because it allows us to collect uh, uh, information about the water through the through different depths. So this is deployed down to 2,000 meters. And then from that, the, the scientists can analyze the data and uh, look at the health of the uh, health of the water, look at how it changes from the different locations that we're going to, and they can start to map out how the how the water in the Indian Ocean is behaving and what that means for the, the ocean health. Um, then we have what is probably our the, the simplest piece of equipment that we use on board, but is uh, shows absolutely fantastic data, and that's it's called a Newston net. And I'm sure Lucy talked about this yesterday, um, but this is just showing you how you know that we have the submersible. That's the that's the focus of our expedition. But then we also have in and around that we have all these different bits of equipment. So it's not just the submersible. You don't have to just be involved in the submersible. We have biologists. We have water chemists. We have a whole different range of, of uh, ocean scientists on board. And then the last picture, unfortunately, I don't have any pictures of it set up, but this is um, the team setting up the BRUVS, which is a uh, baited remote underwater video system. So it, it has bait and cameras on it, and that allows us to get the really amazing pictures and data of uh, biodiversity and the different animals that we can find in the, in the areas that we've been working at. Typically, they deploy this to about 50 meters, 60 meters, and they leave it for a few hours or, um, and then come back and analyze the data. And it's all just everything that Nectar is doing is trying to collect as much data and as much information as possible. Um, so as, as you've seen there, there's the different, you know, there's lots of different teams, there's lots of different people involved. And what my job is, is to, to bring all these teams together uh, to to make the mission successful, we have, um, you know, without all these individual teams, we would it wouldn't be as big an expedition. So it's it's an absolutely vital that we have so many uh, amazing scientists on board. Um, and then I've just got one more little picture at the end. Uh, this is just some of the science team, just to show you that, you know, every every single piece of equipment that we put in the water has got some form of, of sensor on it or um, or equipment and that's to maximize our productivity and make sure that you know for the 35 days that we spend at sea that we're collecting as as much as much data as possible to make it there's uh, the best expedition we can um, yes I think that's about I just want to move on to the questions. Mike, that, I mean, absolutely amazing. And and it's when you think about a single uh, submersible going down, it's very easy to think that it just takes sort of two people uh, to to hop in a hop in one of these submersibles and they're jolly on down to to, to the yeah. bottom of the sea. But it's it's great to see there's such a, a a range of different roles on board, and certainly we've been having some of the the live chat questions and comments coming over about, you know, I now want to be a scientist. I'm really interested by all, by all this work. Um, we've got an amazing uh, array of questions that have been pre-submitted. And do remember that up to 24 hours uh, before a live lesson, you can submit questions in advance and we'll, we'll, we'll prioritize those and then come to those which have been submitted via the live chat. Um, so a little bit of a test for you here, Mike. I hope you're ready. I'm ready. Um, uh, this is from uh, Avgalia Linodazi Private School. Uh, and they're wondering, and you, you mentioned a little bit of this, but what tools and methods uh, do, do the team use to collect living samples, living specimens? Yes, that's a really good question. Um, 
We have a few different things. So obviously, as I mentioned on the submersible, we have uh, a manipulator arm. So that's a robotic arm that's controlled from inside the submersible. Uh, the passenger or the co-pilot has a has a control unit, and they can uh, control the arms. The arm extends out from the submersible, and it's got uh, pincers on the end of it, and they can use that to collect uh, rock samples if we're looking for geology, or they can use that to collect some coral samples if we if we think we found a new species of coral. Uh, the science team can can collect that with the submersible, put it in a, a special what's called a bio box. Um, so basically, that's just a it's just a box that we can put the sample in, and then we can bring it to the surface, and then the scientists can do all their analysis on it. We also have I, I mentioned the the picture. Um, I'll just bring it back up again. This picture here is called a Newstone net, and that is towed behind the vessel. Um, and they do that during the day, during the night, at different times, and then they can collect various plankton samples. Um, and again, for, for analysis, so they do that during the day and then at night because one of the, I think it's, it's the largest migration in the earth, on the planet is the vertical migration at nighttime as the as animals and plants move up through the water column. So we do this at different times of the day so we can look at how those species of, of plankton are changing throughout the day. I, it, is it safe? I mean, you know, you're collecting possibly new species or species that haven't been described by science before is it safe for you to collect these new species and is it safe for 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 those specimens that you collect yeah that's really interesting i mean obviously we want to be as uh, have as little impact as possible on the ocean so wherever possible we we don't want to be uh collecting vast amounts of things from the ocean we want to try and leave everything where it is but then on the flip side of that, it's really important to understand the ocean and understand the health of the ocean. We need to know what animals are there, what plants are there. And in order to, to do that, if it's not been seen before, the only way we can do that, unfortunately, is to bring those up to the surface. Um, okay. Now, is it safe for the, the, the corals? I mean, lots of the deep water corals um, and animals that they're used to living under pressure. So... We, we don't want to bring those up unless we have to for descriptive purposes. Uh, and then for the scientists on board, uh, yeah, we have, you know, they, they have uh, PPE that they wear to make sure that they don't get cut on them or, or contaminate the samples with their own, you know, uh, fingertips or anything like that. So everyone wears PPE and lab, uh, lab coats, glasses, and so it's, it is very safe. And, and just, just just to ask, I mean, we're probably hearing that that you know the acronym PPE more and more um, in, in the news at the moment. But it, but it stands for is it protective personal equipment or personal protective equipment? Yes, it's it's personal protective equipment. So that takes many forms. And for the for the scientists in the lab, that means that they wear well. Just backing up, basically PPE, as it says, is personal protective equipment. It's designed there to keep keep the wearer safe. So offshore. That's also one of my jobs is to make sure that everyone stays safe. So in the lab, they wear lab coats, they wear glasses, they wear gloves because they're working with various chemicals. And as you just mentioned, they're working with samples that we've collected from the, from the ocean. But then while we're working on the deck, um, you know, we've got lots of heavy equipment. The, the submersible weighs 11 tons. The landers weigh about a ton and a half each. Uh, the CTD weighs 500 kilograms. You know, everything is very heavy. There's lots of cables and cranes moving around. So it's uh, it's very key that we keep everyone safe. And one of the ways that we do that is with PPE. So that's hard hats, safety shoes, overalls. Um, yeah. Brilliant. Thank you. I'm, I'm now going to sh shift our focus a little bit to the environment. And there's some questions that have been sent through from uh, Draper's uh, Mills Primary Academy. Um, and going back to uh, the the CMATs, which you you mentioned, um, so the fo the focus of, of of the study. Yes. Interestingly, what uh, the first off is is do you by any chance know what the what the tallest mountain under the sea is? So the tallest mountain under the sea is uh, Mauna Kea, off of uh, in Hawaii. Amazing, and um, with, with with these mountains, do do we know what kind of sea life? Um, 
lives on them. I know we can probably put a link to, to, to Lucy's talk yesterday where that's covered in more detail. But but what what kind of things might you find down there? So that's really interesting. And I, I think absolutely Lucy will be able to give a much better, uh, a much more comprehensive answer than I could. So I think, you know, for those that haven't, go back and listen to her talk yesterday. But in terms of the life that you find on the seamounts, I mean, they are one of, they're often described as underwater Galapagoses. You know, they go from um, the seafloor, so in the Indian Ocean, that's somewhere around 4,000 metres, and the, the, the tops of these seamounts, the tops of the mountains can be anywhere from 50 metres to 20 metres to 300 metres below the surface. So there's such a, they, they span such a wide um, range of the ocean that, that depending on where they are and the, the size of them, you can get all kinds of different animals and creatures. I'm shifting sort of around a bit, but the you, you were talking before that you're going to be, you know, these expeditions are 35, 40 days long, yes, um, yes. all of you on the boat. How, how, how do you prepare yourself mentally uh, for, for this kind of expedition? And that's coming through from the Ottoman Public School in Sydney, Australia. Yeah, that's, a, that's really interesting. It is... Um, it is very. It's a very unique experience to be away from from home for for thirty five days, forty days, sometimes fifty days, um, and I think everyone has to prepare for that, you know, differently. And for me personally, it's spend time with friends and family before you go, and then um, so that once you're away, you know, we have very good internet on board. We have great communications, so people can still speak to their friends and family at home. But it can be very difficult, and preparing mentally is something that you know, it is a key thing to do for these expeditions. But once you're there, it's, you know, there it's, it's fun and there's lots of work going on. You're always busy. So the 35 days, the 40 days really does fly by. And, and you, I mean, I'm just, just wondering because um, obviously it's quite hard to prepare mentally for being in a submersible if you haven't been in one before. For those scientists going down, um, what what do you do if a team member starts panicking in a sub? And is there any way that you can help help sort of stop that from happening? Yeah, so I mean, the uh, I, I'm sure we've got some pictures of them. As Nexon have used two different types of submersible um, in the 2019 expedition, we used the the 1K2 submersible, which are um, they've got a big transparent uh, acrylic pressure sphere so when you're in it it's like a reverse goldfish effect so um you know you can see out there's lots of space it's it's great but then this expedition the 2020 expedition to the sea mounts um using this uh, full ocean depth submersible that was made by triton is because it can go down to the full ocean depth it's made of titanium so it has some viewports but they're they're not as big um on the just bring up the picture of the first slide I have. Um, you can see there in front of the um, where that central light is. There's two holes. There, there, there are the viewports. Um, so inside that, it is very small. It's, it's a tight space to get into it, and you know, there is always the risk that if if people are claustrophobic or don't like small spaces, it's it, it might not be the best place for them to be. Um, but what we do before anyone gets in the submersible to do a dive, whether that's the the what the small submersibles we used last year or the big one we used this year, everyone gets a full safety briefing from the pilot. Everyone gets to sit in the sub. Everyone gets to sit in there with the hatch closed and make sure they're comfortable with the space, um, and just make sure that they're happy. If everyone is happy, if if people are happy with that, then we go to the to the launch. And then once they get in the sub, once it's in the water, we make sure that for a few minutes on the surface, people are sat in there, they get comfortable, just, you know, to make sure that everyone's happy. And then once it's diving, if people become unhappy or claustrophobic or, or panic, um, there are various things that the pilots can do to calm them down. And um, we would stop and they can talk them through it. They can talk to the surface. And if, if we had to, we would, we would immediately bring the submersible back to the surface and get people out. So it's a really, it's a difficult question to answer, but a very interesting question because we, um, you know, it, people don't know how they're going to react to different things until they're in it. But yeah. I will say that um, 
we haven't had anyone that hasn't that has panicked inside it because again your your mind is on other things you're doing the science you're operating the submersible um so you know, everyone that's been in there so far has been really happy great Th thanks mike um, just to say, I'm just going to go and pick up a question, couple of questions from the live chat because there's stacks on there, but I'll, I will come back to the pre-submitted questions in just a bit. Uh, so the question, uh, this is from um, Camille in, in London, who's asked a whole range of questions, and I'm just going to pick one sort of more on the operations side, Mike. Yeah. Um, and she's asking, are, are there sometimes storms um, and you're not ready for that and it, and it can sort of wreck, wreck the equipment? Um, yes, that's uh, very interesting. So we obviously monitor the weather uh, extensively while we're offshore. Um, I mean, when we're doing a dive with this submersible, it can be under the water for a dive for six to eight hours. So in that time, the weather on the surface can change. Um, part of the planning phase of this and part of what, what I do is we look at historical weather and we pick when the best time of the year to go is. So for the Indian Ocean, for the Seychelles and the Maldives. Um, the best time of the year is now. So between March and April um, has got the best weather. Um, so we, it, it absolutely can. I mean, the storms in the Indian Ocean can get, get crazy and they, they can wreck the equipment, but um, any big storms that were coming, we would know about from our weather forecasts and we would try and avoid those or we would... Um, you know, make sure everything's tied down and safe and we'd ride out any bad weather. Um, if we were in a situation where the weather picked up and we didn't know it was going to happen while the submersible is down, um, then the most dangerous part of any of the submersible operations is the, is the launch and the recovery. So that's getting the submersible from the ship into the water and then getting it from the water back onto the ship. As you can imagine, an 11 ton um, piece of titanium on the end of a wire can can cause a wrecking ball effect so that's the most dangerous part for us and that's where everyone has to be focused so if there was if the weather came up while the um submersible is down we would just leave the submersible down at depth um while we assess what we're going to do and what wait for the weather to pass um this submersible can stay down for up to 96 hours uh, with, with no problem it wouldn't be very comfortable for the passengers but it would be a lot more comfortable than uh, being recovered in, in in bad weather. Brilliant. Thanks, Mike. Thanks so much for that. I just got a, um, a question coming through. This was uh, Matthew Cooper on the live chat asking what the focus of this live lesson is, and it's all about the operations side and the team needed to explore the underwater world. But just to pick up um, a really, really important expedition question, perhaps for me, one of the most important from the expeditions that I have been on, and that's from Cam and Joe Plummer, is what do you eat on board? Oh, the, the food on board is incredible. Um, the, the, the pressure drop, the, uh, the, the cooks and the, the, the team that work in the galley are, are phenomenal. Um, you definitely don't go hungry. Um, they cater for all diets. So we obviously have a multi, uh, multinational crew on board. So uh, the team in the, in the galley prepare food um, for all those different teams. So they do breakfast and dinner in the morning because we, we obviously run 24 hours a day. So it's quite unique when you go for your breakfast. You can either have a, you know, have a bowl of cereal or you can have a full, uh, a full dinner at 6 o'clock in the morning. It's up to you. Um, and then they do lunch and then they do in the evening again, they do a breakfast and uh, a breakfast and dinner combination, but the food is uh, is incredible on board. Uh, they you never go hungry. They're always making uh, yeah lots of cakes and desserts and keeping keeping morale up and keeping everyone happy by uh, keeping us well fed. Yeah, as, as Napoleon said, an army marches on its stomach. Absolutely, yeah. And uh, I think without without good uh, without a good team in the galley, it would be a whole different expedition. But the uh, the 2019 one and the 2020 expedition have had incredible uh, incredible teams in the galley and keep everyone well fed and happy. So, Mike, I'm I'm, I'm just assuming you're not on board a, a research vessel at the moment, quite because I've got a question coming through here is, is about um, how safe it is to use um, a submarine during the current pandemic. Yes, uh, so I am currently sat in my uh, in my house in London. I'm not on a research vessel. 
Um, obviously, the the global pandemic, the COVID nineteen, was um, unprecedented times, and it's something that we haven't had to deal with before. But the the operations, any any research operation or offshore operation, is a uh, has a comprehensive set of safety procedures and policies in place, and that allows us, you know, that, that ranges from, you know, um, risk assessments and um, paperwork to make sure that everyone knows how we're going to do things. Um, and then also, if something were to go wrong, we have um, evacuation procedures and medical procedures, and you know, we, we identify every hospital that we could go to and how we would get people there. So, you know, offshore operations are, although dangerous. Um, they are very controlled and very safe. Um, and if done, you know, if done properly, you know, everyone has a good time and stays safe. And if there is a problem, it's, it's dealt with very efficiently. Um, as for the, the global pandemic that's going on at the moment, I mean, of, of course it, um, with the, um, with the resources that are being taken out of every day, um, with the resources that are being taken away from, you know, hospitals, whether that's hospitals in the Seychelles or the Maldives or London, because of the pandemic, that would affect um, our ability to to deal with evacuations. But it's something that is continually monitored on board. And, you know, we have some sort of, uh, we call them red lines, but we have steps basically that if certain things are triggered, then we stop operations because that means it's not safe. So one of those is looking at, you know, the hospitals that we would evacuate people to. And if they become too busy or too full because of the pandemic, then we would then stop operations. So, yes, I think in answer to the question, yes, the global pandemic does affect the safety, but it never compromises the safety. It just affects how we deal with it. Well, Mike, really glad to hear that you and the team are, are safe and well and, and back home where, wherever that, that may be. Um, I'm, I'm just coming on to sort of like to talk about the team, you mentioned a few of the of the different roles there, but I mean, if it's speaking to young people, what are the kinds of things that they might want to think about in terms of careers? This is following on a question from yeah. Artman Public School in in Australia, and and what might they do to sort of get towards being doing your job, perhaps? Yeah, so I mean, my job, my as I said, my my background was uh, oceanography so physical oceanography at the uh, the university of southampton here in the uk and then i moved into um my job title was a hydrographic surveyor so that was mapping the seabed um for commercial uh, reasons not for scientific expeditions so that was building uh, assisting to build uh, wind farms and oil and gas platforms things like that so i think my background is you know i, I was very very into science and maths at school uh, when I did my GCSEs and A-levels, I did lots of science and math subjects. Um, and then once, and then at university, I did uh, physical oceanography and and then, yeah, moved into, did some additional courses to move into being a hydrographic surveyor. Um, I think with anything to do with expeditions and, and the ocean, I think the most important thing is a passion for the ocean. Um, as we've touched on, you know, you, you can spend... 35 days, 40 days, 50 days away from home. Um, although it's fun, it still is. Um, you, know, you are still away from home, so you have to love what you do. And it, it's, you know, I think if you've got a passion for the ocean and you, and you like science and technology, then any kind of ocean career is, I would highly recommend it. And, uh, and I mean, Mike, this is a follow up. Uh, do, do you, you mentioned you've got this degree in, in phys physical oceanography. Are, are there roles on board at an expedition like this which don't require a degree? Yes, of course there are. Um, there's there's lots of different roles. So I mean, the the if, if we go from from the top, you've got the vessel crew. Um, so that's mixed of obviously we've got the starts with the captain, and then there's the vessel officers, and then there's the 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 deck crew, the vessel crew. Um, depending on the role, there's different different requirements some is just on the job training uh some is through cadet ships and um things like that and then in terms of the science i mean most of the the research scientists that we have are all through um are doing research with with universities so typically most of them will have a degree um but that's for the research scientists but then we also have uh, probably half of our 
team is made up of technicians and specialists in different areas. So the CTD that I talked about, which was the, um, which was, if I can find the picture, uh, this thing here. So here we have one water chemist um, that analyzes all the data from that. But then actually to operate it, we had two other technicians and they don't need a degree to do that. It's um, again through, you know, on the job training with different marine institutes and just becoming familiar with the equipment. Um, and that's the same for the submersible. I mean, the, the submersible technicians, um, some of them have got uh, electrical engineering backgrounds from university, uh, the ones that, you know, the guys that have designed the electrical systems. But again, on board, um, the people that operate it, it is varies. Some have got degrees and some are just technicians and they've just done internships with Triton or different marine technology companies and, and worked their way up through there. So you absolutely don't have to have a degree to be involved in an expedition. Um, you know, there is a whole manner of different, different roles on board. Mike, very that's brilliant. I mean, very sadly, we're running out of time. There've been so many great questions coming through. Can can I quickly go th give you some quick fire a quick Absolutely. fire round? Uh, uh, do you use walkie talkies? Yes, we do. Um, how else do you communicate? Do, do you with a submarine? Because a submersible, can you do a walkie talkie? No, we can't use it. So when it's on the surface, we can use a walkie-talkie. When it's down at depth, we use a, an acoustic modem. So it's it's like a walkie-talkie, but it, it works acoustically and it sends the the signal through the water. Does it, anything ever break? Absolutely, all the time. But that's all part of the fun. <laughs> and and how do you do? I mean, do you, do you have people who can fix it on board? Yes, yeah, so that's what I was I was uh, in the previous question. All the yeah. technicians on board. Uh, we carry spares for everything. We're obviously in a very remote area, so we can't just call up uh, call up a shop and get a spare part. So we carry spares, and then um, uh, the, the technicians are fantastic, and they can fix anything. And there's not much you can't fix on the ship without with uh, duct tape and cable ties. <laughs> um, what main re regions have you explored with with Necton, and will you explore with Necton? So at the moment, Necton's uh, area of focus is the Indian Ocean. Um, we've got, we, yeah, we, there's a series of expeditions planned there. And then after the Indian ocean, I don't know, wherever, uh, the hot, there's a, there's a whole world. I'm sure there'll be somewhere else as equally as interesting, but that's for the, uh, the science team to decide where is the most important area for us to study. And then, and then we plan based on that. Uh, from Draper's Mill Primary Academy, how many mountains are there under the sea? That's a very good question. We think that it's estimated as about 300,000, um, but we don't really know. And that's why the work that Necton and other you know, research institutes are doing is so important. Um, the sea mounts, the undersea mountains that we were visiting this year have uh, never been, you know, we, they know that they're there from satellite data, but they've never been um, stepped put on is the wrong word because it's in the ocean, but they've never been explored by humans before. So, we think there's 300,000, but, you know, we don't know. And that's why exploring the ocean is so important. Brilliant. With, with 50 people on board a, a ship, does everybody already know each other? Or do you have to sort of, you know, find some way of, of gelling the team together? No, everyone doesn't know each other. Um, you know, within the teams, they probably will know each other. So like within the science team, they probably have worked together before. Within the submersible team, they might have worked together. But as a whole, will all 50 people work together? No. And that's one of the key things of, of working offshore is, um, you know, making sure that the team gels and if people are, get on with each other and are friendly, then operations are safe or operations are happy. So we spend a lot of time at the beginning, um, you know, in the lead up to the expedition, we have lots of meetings, Skype calls to you know, introduce everyone. And then during the, the mobilization phase, so that's the beginning of the project. That's when we're getting all the equipment ready. Um, we spend a lot of time doing team building exercises and just making sure that everyone gets to know each other. But, you know, by the end of 35 days, people that, you, you know, the 50 people on board, you might never have met before, but you're all like a, a small family by the time you uh, get off. And my last question, very sadly, um, I'm going to mash a few questions together. Uh, is a vampire squid attack on a submarine part of your risk assessment? It is not part of our risk assessment. Um, maybe it should be, though. Um, I think 
we we do have risk assessments for different you know encounters with things in 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 the water in the water but i haven't uh, i haven't written as one specifically for a vampire squid but maybe i will Brilliant. Mike, thank you so, so much uh, for being part of Necton Submarine STEM 2020 and explaining brilliantly uh, the operations behind exploring the deep. And thank you to all those who have been watching and for all your wonderful, wonderful questions. It's been great having you with us. And thank you to Imarsat for supporting these live lessons about submarine exploration and science. So for the rest of the week, Mike's coming back uh, this afternoon, and that's really so that our schools in the North America can tune in live as well. Tomorrow, we have the great team from Triton talking about submarine STEM, the engineering and technology behind these wonderful um, submersibles. And then lastly, we have really the whole point of this submarine conservation how can all this exploration technology data be used to protect our oceans so until the next time it's bye bye from submarine stem and see you soon bye bye